Okay, so we're back again. Hopefully I've uh, un unmuted everything and uh, everyone can hear me out there. Can you guys hear me in here? Yep. Yeah, we've got you. Um, okay, we are ready to go. Sorry about that. I just had a, a hiccup pop in the middle of the screen there and I had to get rid of it to see what we were doing. But Jerry Britton's here. Um, where are we, where are you from again, Jerry? I've, I've lost my bit of paper with the program. Yeah, that's fine. It's a little area called Edders in South central Pennsylvania. Uh, put it in perspective. It's about two hours West of Philadelphia and about an hour North of Baltimore. Ah, so here we go. We're going all the way over basically to the East coast from, uh, from Australia. So it's only about a 25 hour flight. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll hand the uh, stage over to yourself, uh, Jerry, and um, I'll uh, maximize your PowerPoint when you put it up. All righty. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining. I uh, want to give a special shout out to my, my friends from the Pennsylvania Railroad Technical and Historical Society. The presentation that I'm giving today, uh, I'd been working on for a couple of years, and it was supposed to be presented two weeks ago at our annual meet. So uh, hopefully some of you are tuning in and, and listening. So at this point, uh, I'll go ahead and switch to my PowerPoint. Let's see. All right. Are you seeing it? Yep, we've got that here. Okay. So uh, I model an HO scale in the 1950s, um, part of the what was the middle division between Harrisburg and Altoona uh, within Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, HO scale, early 1950s. And while I was doing research for a prototype location to model, uh, I came across a uh, trip of the president from uh, Washington, D.C. to State College, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, I went to school at uh, the University of uh, Pennsylvania State University in the 1980s. And there was a local um, a short line there called the Belfont Central. And it actually closed down in 1984. I was there at the very, very end of it. Uh, fascinating little 11 mile line. But uh, a book came out called Rails to Penn State uh, by Mike Bazila. And uh, I picked it up to learn more about the, the short line, even though I was already a Pensy modeler. And it's a fascinating book. Uh, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of lime traffic on the line, but they provided the last link between the Pennsylvania Railroad at Belfont, reaching out 11 miles to State College, uh, Pennsylvania, the home of Penn State. So uh, the book in and of itself was a fascinating read. Uh, but one part caught my eye in particular, and there's two or three pages where it told the story of in 1953, uh, uh, President Eisenhower took a train to State College, to the university. His brother Milton was the president of the college. Um, so it was interesting in that it, it provided all the names of the cars that were in the consist. And it just kind of picked my interest about, you know, how many other trips there might have been across the Pensy. And although this, uh, presentation was geared towards the Pensy Society. A lot of this information is going to be of interest to, to anybody modeling any line. So following reading that, I, uh, I started Googling and I, I found a reference to the book in the center called The President Travels by Train. And I, I bought a copy and this thing is, is like an inch and a half thick. Uh, and it really covers the gamut of history of, of the president traveling by train. And it has uh, probably well over a hundred consists over time, over all the railroads and roads like the B and O the New York central um, and some of the roads to the South, they got the, the lion's share of, of the traffic. Uh, the Pensy was actually a minor player. Uh, moving on uh, just more recently, Mike Bazila put out a second book, Branch Line Empires, which was all about the, the PRR in the New York central in the coal fields of, uh, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Belfont. And it too referenced the, the POTUS train going uh, to Penn State. 
And the one thing that stood out is in Rails to Penn State, Mike had said that uh, the power for the train was two PRRE eights. And in branch line empires, he said they were FP sevens. And, <clears throat> you know, being a prototype modeler, I'm like, well, which is it? Well, I tracked him down. I, we'd been virtual acquaintances for years. And he uh, couldn't remember where he got that. Um, the Belfont Central closed down in, in 1984. And all of their records were in the attic above the engine house in Belfont. And Mike went in there and saved them and took them to Petit Library at the Pennsylvania State University. And they are now in their archives there. And as you'll see a little later, uh, I've got photos of a lot of those records that that uh, that Mike saved. So in answering the, the engine question, I said, well, one thing i got to do is, is go to Petit Library. So I arranged to make a trip up there to inspect the, the collection. and. Uh, I invited Mike along. So that's Mike on the right there, the author of the two books. So the two of I, two of us poured over all the documents and uh, you know, that's what really led to this presentation. Going back on the history on, of the POTUS on, on the Pensy, uh, there's a couple notable trips early on. Martin Van Buren is thought to be the first president to ride on the Pensy. Um, William Henry Harrison, first campaign on the Pensy. Uh, John Tyler and James Buchanan, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Johnson, quite a few have, have been on the Pensy at various times. Famous photograph, uh, almost everybody has seen this at one time or another. Purportedly uh, in this photo is Abraham Lincoln on his way to deliver the Gettysburg Address. This is on the Northern Central Railway, which was a subsidiary of the Pensy in 1863. Here we have Teddy Roosevelt at Lewistown, 1912. Hoover on the Manhattan Limited in 1928. And here you got another Roosevelt uh, during the war years. Truman, 1947. And here we have uh, Dwight Eisenhower in 1952 on a campaign train. He's actually taking a few moments to uh, chat with some of the PRR employees. And here's Dwight in the cab of a GG1. And there's JFK after the Army-Navy game in 1961. Talking into, about the operations, uh, so the presidential train used the call sign POTUS. The Secret Service often had different call signs and they called it City Hall. And prior to 1942, regular Pullman equipment was used to transport the president. Uh, there was seven uh, Pullman cars that, that Pullman constructed for rentals in 1927. They were all named after world explorers. And the Raoul Amundsen was the one that was used most often. A typical concepts was a baggage car which carried two or three automobiles. Uh, you know, they get out somewhere, they unload the automobiles, and could travel from there. There was a, com a communications car uh, that, for years, was the B and O Combine fourteen oh one until it was replaced by a, a new car that we'll discuss later. There were usually three or four Pullman sleepers for press correspondence. Then they'd have a working press car, which was stripped of its seats and fitted with work tables, a dark room, and a Western Union office. One or two diners furnished by the host railroad. A lounge car for the staff and press. Two or three Pullmans for the presidential staff. A Pullman for the Secret Service detail, confidential secretaries, and per perhaps political advisors. And then the presidential car bringing up the rear. They often ran a pilot train ahead of the POTUS train just to make sure everything on the track was safe. And they often had a protect power following the train or would stage it somewhere along the line. Security was uh, paramount, obviously. And uh, you know, this page, I won't read it word for word, but there was a lot of requirements about uh, oncoming traffic stopping you know, 30 minutes in advance not being able to use interlockings to cross tracks ahead of this train within like 30 minutes, 
uh, any manual turnouts, they would, they would spike in place and uh, so on and so on. There's a, an example of a, the point spiked on a, on a manual uh, switch. I mentioned the B&O Combine 1401. This was the communications car from 1942 to 1952. And now we get into the golden age of, of travel, which would have been uh, the 40s and 50s. Um, the presidential rail car was the Ferdinand Magellan. It was one of those seven cars from Pullman. Uh, they, they refitted it in 1942, and it was in use through 1958. <clears throat> there was a new dedicated communications car, uh, which was USA 87325. Call sign was POTUS-1, and it had the name General Albert J. Meyer. It was a converted hospital car. And there was also a Secret Service protection detail car, uh, USA 89426, POTUS 2, and it had the uh, code name MORN, also a converted hospital car. And together, the last two cars, the communications car and the detail car, they called Crate. And quite honestly, I have no idea where those came from, but that was the deal. Ferdinand Magellan, uh, built in 1929 by Pullman. Again, one of the, uh, the cars named after the explorers. And after the United States entered World War II, the Secret Service and the White House press secretary felt that the president needed a dedicated, specially equipped car to protect them. So they selected the Ferdinand Magellan. And here it is at the Pullman shops in Wilmington uh, for the 1942 rebuild. It's already been pretty much stripped in this photo. Um, you note the, the trucks because you're going to see new trucks a little later. There's the two ends of the car. This is inside the car at the vestibule, vestibule end. You're looking uh, forward in the left photo and you're looking rearward in the right photo. And then back in the lounge looking forward in the left photo, looking rearward in the right photo. And there's new trucks that were specially built for this car. The original car had five bedrooms. They reduced it to four. The dining room and observation lounge were enlarged. Two of the bedrooms were a suite for the president and the first lady with a fully equipped bathroom, including a bathtub and they connected the two bedrooms. The dining room could also be used as a conference room with a solid mahogany table. And the front end of the car held quarters for two stewards, a pantry, a galley, mechanical equipment, storage, and ice bunkers. And these two diagrams show the original plan uh, at the top and the new plan at the bottom. So you can see uh, how the dining room got larger as well as the observation room. And if you look um, towards the middle of the car, bedroom C is the president's room. And then to the right of that, you have the, the bathroom facilities. And then bedroom B is the first lady's room. The car was protected with 5 8 inch armor plate on the sides, top, bottom, and ends. The windows were replaced with three inch thick 12 ply laminated bullet resistant glass. And there was a bank of vault style door at the rear entrance to the car. There were two escape hatches. And there were exterior loudspeakers for public address and a telephone in every room that could be connected train side whenever they were in the station. That took the car from 160,000 pounds to 285,000 pounds, making it the heaviest passenger rail car ever in the United States. It was painted Pullman green to mix in with other Pullmans, but the name was not printed on the car. You'll see photos in later years with the name. That was not while it was in service. And to lessen the chance of sabotage during the war, it didn't have a permanent storage place in, in D.C. It was moved around placed at various sidings, intermixed with other Pullmans, etc. 
Although this photo is dark, this is a builder style photo uh, showing the car after the rebuild in 1942. That's the lounge looking rearward. Lounge looking forward. Dining room looking forward. And that's the president's stateroom. And that's one of the other staterooms. They also installed a wheelchair elevator for the president. It's currently shown in, in its up position off to the side of the, uh, the observation deck. And it was promptly removed after Roosevelt's death in 45. These two shots also show the, the elevator. Uh, on the right, you can see it had an integral ramp. And on the left, that shows the ramp in the up position. The car was presented to Roosevelt in December of 42, and his first trip was to Miami, Florida, where he boarded a Pan Am Airways flying boat for his trip to the uh, notorious Casablanca Conference in 1943. Roosevelt traveled approximately 50,000 miles in the car over the next two years, and his last time was on the trip to Warm, Warm Springs, Georgia, two weeks before he died there. Truman used the car more than Roosevelt, because it was available for his entire presidency, and Eisenhower used the car only three times. So it seems like the car had kind of a short life, but what, what really happened there that changed the, the landscape was uh, the advent of larger airplanes. So uh, you start getting into you know, what would become Air Force One. Here's a picture in the 1940s showing a, a car with the loudspeakers affixed to the top. It was also used uh, occasionally for uh, people other than the president. Here's a picture of uh, General, then General Eisenhower with uh, Winston Churchill in 1946. Here's Truman uh, during his campaign. He traveled more than 29,000 miles on the, on the car. And here's the infamous scene of him holding up the, the newspaper headline that prematurely said that Dewey defeated Truman in the election. And today the car is restored at the Gold Coast Railroad Museum in Miami, Florida. A 1984, the car was loaned from that museum to the campaign of Ronald Reagan. And in 1992, Hurricane Andrew uh, pretty much totaled the shed that the car was stored under. And as you might expect, based on its specs, it didn't do much to the car. A few scratches, but otherwise uh, not too much damage. And there it is restored uh, more recently under a new shed. Unfortunately, they don't allow anybody to go inside of it. Um, I was on a trip to Florida last year and I tried to make arrangements to uh, get special permission for this presentation to go inside and uh, that was declined. There's the restored dining room. The restored presidential room. And now we move on to the communications car. So the General Albert J. Meyer was the new communications car. And here's a photo of it in 1961 in storage. And here's some of the communications equipment inside of it. And I mentioned the other car that was the Secret Service detail car. Here it is in storage in 1961. It contained a lounge area. And I had found that in later years, sometimes they used Crate, which was the communications car in this car, uh, for some special trips without using the presidential car. Here's Crate in Philadelphia in 1961. The Ferdinand Magellan was taken out of service in 1958, 
and the two communication rail cars were moved. And during the 1960s and 70s, they were stored at the New Cumberland Army Depot, just outside of Harrisburg, PA. Worth noting that when the Magellan was surplused, it was sold to the Gold Coast Museum for $1. All right. So now moving on to POTUS to Penn State. This was the trip that inspired me to do the research when I found that on, on May 9th, 1953, uh, President Eisenhower traveled to State College to visit his brother. The original plan was for him to fly, but poor weather prevailed. And what's amazing about this, for a trip that's going to be on May 9th, how quickly they can put together the, tr the, the rail trip, make all the uh, arrangements for that. It was scheduled to depart, I'm sorry, it was scheduled to depart Washington around 1059 on May 8th. It would travel from Washington to Baltimore on the PRR main line, what today is the Northeast Corridor. Then it would travel up the Northern Central Branch to Harrisburg, which would take it from Baltimore through York to Harrisburg. Then the Middle Division main line to Tyrone. So that would be from Harrisburg through Lewistown to Tyrone, which is just short of Altoona. Then it would hang a right and go up the Bald Eagle branch from Tyrone to Milesburg. And then there'd be a short segment on the Belfont branch to take it into Belfont. At that point, it would take the last 11 miles on the Belfont Central Railroad and arrive in State College around 6.30 a.m. So here's the first record we have uh, of official documentation for this trip. And this is at 1.10 p.m. on May 8th, the day before the actual trip. Zooming in on some of that detail, um, it mentions that they're expecting about 65 people on the train, and it provides the makeup from the head end, uh, several pool, Pullmans, a diner, and the president's private car. Notably absent on this trip, for whatever reason, is the communications car and the Secret Service uh, car for the head end. And if you look at the overall memo in the background, you see kind of a red check mark. The reason we have all these documents is not because of the Pennsylvania Railroad's archives. It's because this was a copy that was, was received by President McClellan of the Belfont Central, and it was in the Belfont Central archives. Here's the planned uh, routing of the train. So they have it staged in Washington. And uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the Pensy trackage, uh, they're, they're showing a route passing through a, a loop track to turn the train around. And then it would proceed to Baltimore and uh, go up through Cly, which was a midpoint on the line to Harrisburg, and then it provides the rest of the route the State College. The middle division of the Pensy, which would be from Harrisburg to Altoona uh, for the middle part of the, the trip, issued their first memo, uh, a two-page document, also on May 8th. It indicated a more granular schedule across the middle division, times leaving Harrisburg and passing uh, basically all the towers along the way at the estimated times. And once again, they repeated the makeup. And here they're calling out some interesting information. Rather than using a dedicated pilot train, they're using one of the Pensy's already scheduled passenger trains to be the pilot train. Uh, this train, the POTUS train is traveling overnight and overnight on the middle division sees approximately 25 to 30 passenger trains each direction each day. And it's a four track main line. So there's dedicated tracks for passenger service versus freight service. Um, so they're using an existing Pensy train as the pilot. They then call out the uh, Altoona rec train that's gonna act as a pilot train from Tyrone to Belfont. And there's a couple of freight trains. They're talking about dispatching them early, um, having them staged at different points. Uh, they call out that Superintendent Jeffries 
and the road foreman of engines will ride the diesel of POTUS across the middle division. Assistant road foreman will ride the pilot train. Assistant road foreman will ride uh, a freight train ahead of the POTUS train on the um, uh, the one branch out of Tyrone to Milesburg. And the Altoona rec train is again acting as a pilot train. It indicates that POTUS will operate on the passenger track from Banks to Tyrone the whole way. And it's given movement under absolute block protection for the following train. All freight movements to be stopped 30 minutes in advance of the POTUS train. And conductor and instructed to inspect train and report if okay, advance freight trains as far as possible. No westward freight trains are to be accepted at Banks after 1.40 a.m. until after POTUS passes. Banks is the tower in the entrance of the middle division when you're, when you're leaving uh, Harrisburg. So basically they're saying no freight trains are going to be accepted at that location coming out of Enola after 1.40 until POTUS passes. And then they also indicate no crossover moves are to be made within 30 minutes of the advance of POTUS. <clears throat> they also get into um, protection of the, the line side right away, calling out police protection during the change of crews. Nobody else is allowed in the cab, um, and a lieutenant and another individual that are going to be riding the train. Uh, Lewistown wreck train is being called just to be on standby, as is an Altoona wreck train. They're also calling uh, master mechanics and other people to be on site at, at various sites to protect the operation of the train. Uh, the last two items here were kind of interesting at first. Um, diesel engine 9819 is to be super inspected and fully fueled out of Altoona to haul the Altoona wreck train. And then you also have a K4 locomotive, which was a uh, 462 passenger uh, locomotive is to be super inspected to be dispatched out of Harrisburg to Denholm headed west for protect. So when, when Mike Bazila and I first read this super inspected, like what does that mean? Um, th does that mean you normally slack on your inspections uh, or is it more like animal house and you're on super secret probation? We weren't sure, but uh, I think the correct answer came from, uh, Bill Volkmer from the Society, and what that meant was when the engines are expected, they're inspected by a supervisor rather than the rank and file. So while the rank and file could normally do an inspection on these, it had to be done by a supervisor. So I believe that's, that's the answer there. Here we have the K4 headed west uh, for protection at Tyrone. All grade crossings will be protected two hours in advance. There's one tunnel along the route, route at Spruce Creek that's going to be protected. Here's uh, the direction to spike all of the facing point switches. They're staging an Osceola wreck train. And all the protection. Here we have uh, a May 8th notice that's specifically addressed to the Belfont Central Railroad. And it basically uh, goes back through most of the details we've already discussed. And here we have a telegram at 4 p.m. the day before where one sleeper is canceled and the loop operation is annulled. Um, so the sleeper being canceled is, is obvious. They, they decided they didn't need it. The loop operation. So another thing about the, the track arrangement, the previous order showed that there was going to be a loop operation in Washington to send the train to Baltimore. Uh, I think somebody realized that in the planning of this, the track arrangement at Baltimore is such that when you're coming from uh, Washington to Baltimore and then you want to proceed up the northern central branch, it's a trailing point connection. So the, 
the regular passenger trains would actually be pulled reverse consist from Washington to Baltimore. The locomotive does a run around, reconnects, and then they pull the regular direction up the northern central branch. So somebody, you know, realized that, hey, when this train gets to, to Baltimore, you're going to have everything in the reverse order. So they did indeed cancel the loop operation at Washington, ran backwards uh, to Baltimore. The engines did a runaround, and then they were oriented correctly for the rest of the trip. Now, here's a handwritten note of Belfont Central uh, George McClellan at, at 4.40 p.m. on the 8th, indicating the cancellation of the, the one Pullman. Uh, Mike had, had discovered that uh, McClellan, I mean, being a small railroad and he was the president, he was very hands-on. Um, you know, they didn't have a ton of employees for an 11-mile short line. He was known for making all these handwritten notes on the backside of blank waybills. And just for this POTUS trip, uh, there must have been several dozen of these handwritten notes. So here's one noting the cancellation of that last Pullman. Then at 6.40 p.m. on May 8th, uh, we've got a telegram that's including the car names. And you can see there on the, the left, we've got the PRR diner number, and we've got the five Pullman names, McKee, Freehold, Bing, Glen Cliff, Floatel, and Afton Canyon. The Afton Canyon is actually a Pensy car. <clears throat> Here's another handwritten note from McClellan. And at the top, it suggests that there's confusion about the time that it's supposed to arrive in State College. The original documentation said 6.30. He's got a handwritten note here saying 5.30. And then there's another place there where it's talking about 7.30. So Mike and I are kind of wondering if, if this was a problem with Eastern Standard Time, Eastern Daylight Time. Um, we weren't sure. Uh, they also know it could flex from that schedule up to a half an hour. Uh, in the middle there, it says State College will not live in cars. It's just pointing out they're not going to be living on board the train while they're in State College and that they may possibly mo then move the cars to Altoona. Another handwritten note from McClellan, uh, return movement, not definite, probably Sunday. And there's a couple of other names listed here. We're not exactly sure what they are. And this is an interesting piece here. Um, when you get to State College on the Belfont Central, there's a train, typic, a passenger train would typically pull past State College, and there was a Y, and they would then back into State College. It was a very, very long siding into State College. So the length of the train wasn't too much of a concern, but because with the president on board, they want to make sure that the tail end is at a specific point. So I think what they were doing was determining the length of the train so they could put a marker out for the engineer so they knew, you know, when he had backed in enough and the, the observation platform would be at the right place. So he's included the length of, of the president's car at 100 feet and the Pullman's at 90 feet each, and he's doing the math. But what's telling about this is it says engines, two units, 140 foot, six inches. That gave Mike and I the clarification of what power was on this. That, that is exactly the length of two EMD E8s. Uh, you can't get that length from any combinations of E7s or FP7s. So we don't have the engine numbers, but we know that they were E8s for sure. More information about uh, the arrival. Now it's saying 7.30 uh, that railroad police will be around the whole train. It's going to back into the station. And uh, down near the bottom rear end of USA 1 at, and I can't read what the heck the, the, the last part is. Uh, but the very last line is interesting. The Belfont Central for passenger service had a rail motor car. And it's showing here that the real motor car is going to be used as a pilot ahead of the special. Here we have a list of the various Pullmans with some numbers after them. 
number dash number for each one, and then there's a total. Mike and I are totally guessing that these are passenger counts, um, possibly in the format adult dash child. Um, the total is 56 dash zero. So that would make sense. You wouldn't have any children on the, on the train. They were looking for about 65 passengers initially. 56 is in that ballpark. Um, so we think this is probably passenger counts. Uh, on the right side of the handwritten note, you can see that uh, there's notes about uh, two representatives uh, that are in specific cars and what rooms. And we have the business card of one of them, the general passenger agent, for reference for the Belfont Central. Belfont Central also issued uh, this list showing their grade crossing protection. So again, we've got an 11-mile railroad, and they had to arrange grade crossing protection for every single grade crossing. The other thing we found that was interesting is there was an envelope full of canceled tickets. Uh, and these tickets were canceled on the 7th of May, two days before the trip. So I guess for reimbursement, they basically issued and canceled a whole bunch of tickets, but they ended up in an envelope in the Belfont Central Archives, which is kind of cool. Um, although they, they were never in the hands of the people on the trip, it was kind of cool being a, able to go through these tickets and know that one of them was representative of the President of the United States. Here they are arriving in State College. Uh, that's the Ferdinand Magellan there on the left. Part of the train station can be seen there on the right. That building still exists today uh, in use as a bus station. While they were in town, uh, Milton and his wife Helen, uh, the brother, boarded the Magellan and they had breakfast with Dwight and Mamie. They went fishing at nearby Spruce Creek, Pennsylvania, which is a renowned trout stream. Um, I know President Carter went there quite a bit. They went and played golf at Center Hills Country Club. They only got 15 holes in. They stayed over for church on Sunday, and then Ike flew home on uh, the then presidential plane, a, a Lockheed Constellation named Columbine II. Mamie stayed over and crowned Miss Penn State on Monday evening, then was chauffeured back to Washington by car. Here they are disembarking at State College after breakfast. And after the fishing trip, um, it mentions that uh, one of the university professors, uh, George Harvey, a renowned fly fisherman, escorted them, and Ike caught over 20 rainbow, brook, and brown trout. That would be Milton on the left. And there's the two brothers. Uh, displaying the fish, we, we found a clipping from Des Moines, Iowa that was in the Belfont Central Archives. So this is a different angle of the, the photo where they were uh, showing all the fish they had caught. Here we have another memo. Um, this one's from May 11th, and it is showing that the POTUS private car was deadheaded home on train 502 from Harrisburg to Washington. And for their efforts in, in transporting POTUS for 11 miles, the Belfont Central got $158.14. Wow. But they got another $3.30 for delivering 20 tons of ice for the air conditioning. And an HO scale, uh, I model Lewistown so in, in the 50s. So I can prototypically have this train run by my station every now and then during an operating session. And uh, so I'm building out the train uh, as detailed as I can. I've got two EMD E8s, uh, which are Walders. I have a Pullman McKeefrey 12-1, which is Walders for the crew dorm. The Pullman Holbein 6-3 for the press, which is Walders. Uh, Diner D78DR. The Actual, uh, I, I'm using the Bachman and heavily modifying it. The Bachman represents a class D78C diner. 
Um, so I'm modernizing the roof and I got to change some windows out. That's a work in progress. The Pullman Glencliff, a 6-3 for White House staff is a Walders. Pullman Flotow, 6-3, White House staff is a Walders. The PRR Afton Canyon is a 3-1 solarium observation for the Secret Service. That's from Walders. And finally, the Ferdinand Magellan itself uh, was produced in brass by Overland Models a number of years ago. There were only 150 made. Um, actually, there were two versions. There was a, a Truman era version, which is what I needed, and there was a Ronald Reagan era version. Um, the Truman era version, there were only 150 made. And I, I had a search listing set up on eBay, and it took me eight years to locate one. So I, uh, I snagged it, and that's part of my collection. <clears throat> I went out in, to the uh, presidential library online and found Roosevelt's appointment calendar. And here we have uh, showing at 11 o'clock that the party is traveling to from uh, the White House to Union Station. And it's saying at 11.59, they left Union Station. Notes they spent the weekend at the home of Dr. and Mrs. Milton Eisenhower, Pennsylvania State College. Penn State would become a university later that year. The log continues um, that they attended church services at the Pennsylvania State College Chapel. The president flew back to Washington and arrived at 6.50 p.m., motored to the White House, and Mrs. Eisenhower remained in State College. And that is the end. So at this point, I can uh, try to field any questions there might be. Perfect, Jerry. Um, look, wealth of knowledge. So I'm sure there's going to be some questions out there in the chat, but I'll, uh, I'll ask the first lot. This research that you've put together, um, what sort of time frame um, have you been working on it? And what's kept your interest? What's some interesting points that you've stumbled across that's kept your interest in, in continuing with the research? Well, uh, so I, I, I did my undergraduate work at Penn State. I was there in the uh, uh, early to mid 80s. So I was, I was there at the time of the Belfont Central. And when Mike's book came out, um, you know, I, I wanted more information about that short line, just as kind of a passing thing. And when I saw the POTUS information in there, I'm thinking, okay, if I'm modeling Lewistown and part of the middle division, it's extremely likely that that train went over that route. I'm thinking, yeah, that, that'd be interesting to model. Um, so it, it was kind of one of those casual interests for the longest time. And this probably goes back about uh, 10, 12 years because it, it took me eight years to find the Ferdinand Magellan. So I was, I was looking that early. Um, but it wasn't until after the second book came out from Mike, which I think now is about three or four years ago, that it really pushed me to go to the archives at Penn State. And, you know, once you go down that rabbit hole, it, it just, you know, one question leads to another. And the biggest outstanding question at this point, which isn't critical, but what were the locomotive numbers? <clears throat> um, everything else has fallen into place and, you know, I'm modeling the exact car names and all that. So uh, it, it's just one of those things, like if, as a modeler, if you learn about Sanborn maps, or you learn about Val maps, you can't forget that you've seen them. Uh, you've gone down a rabbit hole and you're stuck there. Yeah, okay. Um, for a, a kind of newbie into the prototype scenarios like that, like I am, how would you recommend um, going about um, researching where to start and and how to go about it? You're talking about the railroad in general. Yeah. Well, it it depends on where your level, where your mindset is from from you got the freelance end of the spectrum to the prototype end of the spectrum. You know, freelance, you know, as your railroad, you can do whatever the heck you want. Prototype, you're modeling a specific location, probably at a specific time. Um, 
and you're trying to make it absolutely as accurate as possible. Somewhere in the middle, you got proto freelance where uh, you look at the um, the VNO or the uh, Tony Custer's original railroad where you place a fictional railroad in a setting that's plausible, like it could have really happened. <clears throat> um, if you want to do a, a prototype model like I do, uh, and I'm doing Lewistown in the 1950s, um, you've got uh, employee timetables that will give you uh, the various locations along the railroad, the towers, stuff like that. The Pensy has a book uh, called the CT1000 that literally lists all the online customers. Um, so that will give you the names of the customers along the route. I know other railroads have similar documents. Uh, some of the Western roads use something that they, they call them click numbers. Uh, same kind of concept. Uh, so that'll, that'll give you a list of the, um, the, the names of the customers. Sanborn maps are fire insurance maps and they were done for most of the major cities, uh, from the late 1800s into like the 1920s. And then in some cases they were updated as late as uh, the 1940s. I don't think any were done after that, but the Sanborn maps for fire insurance document the structures of the town, how many stories they are, how they, are they brick masonry or wood, stuff like that. It also shows the street addresses. Um, they're very accurate for footprints of buildings, but the track work isn't necessarily accurate. So the other piece that you need to get is valuation maps. During World War I, the U.S. government had to take over the railroads to get all the um, material expedited for the war effort and because the railroads weren't getting it done themselves. <clears throat> but then in order to compensate the railroads for the use of their railroads, they required them to produce uh, detailed maps of their infrastructure, and they'd be paid back uh, based on their their rail miles, etc. The valuation maps are to scale. Um, you might get a map about seven feet long that represents a mile of track. Uh, you can look at the there's a uh, part of the template on the page shows you the last time the, the map was updated. So you might find multiple versions of a map and you want to get it as close to your era as possible. And it will give you a very accurate view of how the trackage was laid out. Um, you think of a track chart, which is a schematic. Uh, it doesn't give you any idea of curvature of the right of way. Um, and it's like one line represents a track. When you have a valuation map, you get all the curvatures and there's there's two lines per track approximately an eighth of an inch apart so it just gives you a lot more detail um you can look at telephone books if you know that the line was on a specific street and the sanborn maps give you um the address the telephone books back then you could look up a specific street and address by address find out who was there um versus looking up a name and getting a phone number like we, we did more recently. Uh, so there's a ton of sources. And um, in fact, um, my website, which is pensyrr.com, P-E-N-N-S-Y-R-R.com. If you go there and use the search function uh, and type in the word resources, that should bring up a description of all the resources I just described as well as links to a few sources online where you can get some of those maps. Great. Well, uh, I just I just warn everybody, though, it's a rabbit hole. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Great. I'll be uh, jumping over there, and, and the sounds of a rabbit hole interest me and Martin yeah. greatly. Um, <laughs> how, how's the, the chat over on YouTube looking, Martin? Any questions there? Uh, well, um there's one question here, but I think you answered it at the beginning. What and when was the first presidential car or train? That I would, my research was Pensy based. So um, I don't have that information at hand. I'm sure it is in the, that thick book, the president travels by train. 
I would have to pull that out and look that up to find out what the original, you know, the earliest documented version is. Because early on, there was no special consists. In fact, I'm sure they traveled in, in regular public trains originally. Um, but then the question is, okay, when was the first dedicated train? And, you know, they all would have used common equipment at the time uh, until you get to 1942. Okay. And uh, it says there's another one here. I don't know if you, uh, you breached this, uh, Brad, because I, uh, I had to race inside to attend to, uh, uh, some uh, dog emergencies. The dog <laughs> wanted to go to bed and couldn't get in. in it, it's it, its own bedroom. So anyway, well, that's another story. But anyway. Um, Been there, it, done that. There was one about modifications you're doing to the diner. I model the Pensy myself in about the same era, only a little further east. So the, the Bachman Diner is a D78C. Um the D just denotes diner, 78, 78 foot um, uh, outside of the, but between the vestibules. Um, so there's subtle differences when you get into the D78 series. Uh, perhaps the number of seats in the dining room, perhaps the kitchen arrangement. In this specific case, um, I needed, I needed two things. Uh, first, the Bachman model comes with a Clara story roof. Um, most of those were replaced with a, uh, a rounder arch roof um, when they were rebuilt mostly in the 40s. Um, my website for the Pensy has a lot of information about there's a, there's a full roster of all the passenger cars. And if you, you dive into the, the diners for each car, it shows when they were upgraded. So the first thing I had to do was get a rounder roof on it. And um, it's probably not 100% accurate, but I, I took a very simple approach. I just took squadron putty and filled in both sides of the Clara story and you know, multiple layers and shaped it out. And, and that worked out pretty well. The second thing that I needed to do is uh, in the, on the kitchen side of the car, the Bachman car has three windows the uh, the D78 uh, that I needed only had two there. So I had to fill one and move one. On the uh, walkway side of the car, there's two windows. They needed to be smaller in a slightly different place. So externally, it was kind of like patch and recut. And then uh, the windows are pretty much laid out the same. I am going to do an interior, which will require a little bit of change, uh, but I'm not at that point yet. Cool. Well, I think that's about all uh, the, the uh, extra uh, questions I've got over here. Brad, have you got any others? No, um, I think that's about it here on Facebook too. So It's a pretty, pretty specific subject, so I, I wouldn't expect a ton of questions. Not a ton of questions. Also, I think you did a, a really well-covered clinic wealth of knowledge there and um i thoroughly enjoyed it well thank you yes so and best uh, wishes best wishes to everybody out there during this time yep too true i uh i'm, I'm the same every time i watch these uh history even though i don't model it i don't live there but it's fascinating uh but anyway thanks very much jerry uh well, uh, if you hop in the chat there, I think there's a few people in the Facebook chat that would uh, probably have a conversation with yourself. Um, All right, I'll jump over there. And thanks very much for your time, and we'll speak to you soon. All right, thank you.